to do so quietly, please. The next item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 2971 in the name of Bob Doris on closure of Glasgow Job Centres. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Uh, would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Bob Doris to open the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This motion has at its core the principles of dignity and respect in relation to how we treat vulnerable groups within our communities. The Department of Work and Pensions plans to close half of the job centres in Glasgow undermines such principles and makes no sense in terms of encouraging job seekers back into employment. We are joined this afternoon by MP colleagues today who have forcefully opposed job centre closures across our city. And I want to focus today on the impact on those who use Mary Hill's job centre. Along with Patrick Grady MP, I met with a group of single parents who would be seriously impacted by the closure of Mary Hill Job Centre. And I'd like to thank One Parent Family Scotland for arranging that meeting and for the openness and frankness and honesty of those who spoke to us. Those single parents would require to make a trip to Springburn Job Centre instead. And I know that the local MP there, Anne McLaughlin, shares my concerns over the knock-on consequences for Springburn Job Centre also. Here's what one parent families in Mary Hill had to say about travelling to Springburn. If your child's unwell, how do you get up there? I don't want to take them on the bus. Just now I can ask a neighbour to look after them for a short while, but not for over two hours. Or I suffer from chronic pain. The thought of sitting on buses for almost an hour each way scares me. I'll, it's really worrying and it's scary to lots of people. On the expense of it all, if you used that to get to Springburn, you'd be taking it out of your child's mouth. I suffer from depression and anxiety and I'll not be able to travel to Springburn. I also don't have the money to live on. I couldn't afford the extra expense. What about appointments at Springburn? If the appointment's at 2 p.m., how would you sign on and pick up your wane? It's the same in the morning as well. 10 a.m. means you'd not be able to drop off your kid in time. They, the job centre, don't offer earlier or later. There's not usually anything else available. But, presiding officer, concerns over closures goes far beyond the practicalities of getting to Springburn. For many, it's also about the hard-won relationship and trust that's actually been developed with a benefits advisor over time, crucial in terms of supporting vulnerable groups back into employment. They're unlikely to retain the same work coach. The relationship is likely to be dismantled and much of that trust will be shattered. So job centre staff and the PCS union share these concerns. We all know Job Centre Plus is a toxic brand and there is huge controversy over the UK government's welfare reforms and its sanction regimes. But despite this, many Job Centre Plus staff know very well the key to getting a vulnerable person with barriers to employment ready for work is about nurturing those relationships, sometimes in very difficult circumstances. Here's what one parent family, a one parent family said about the prospect of losing their, their work coach. I've got one in there and they're absolutely brilliant. She knows I've got the wanes and tries to help. I've built a relationship with mine. With others, the trust falls down. Someone else said, you don't want to keep retelling your story. It's often very personal and your, your existing job coach knows you. Presiding officer, along with MP colleagues, I met with senior managers at Job Centre Plus. I requested how many claimants use Mary Hill Job Centre and they were unable to tell us. I asked for a map of the area covered by Mary Hill Job Centre. They were unable to provide it. We requested an equality impact assessment to see how groups such as single parents, carers, or even those with disabilities might be impacted by closure. Job Centre Plus said they would only do one after a decision had been taken. We asked how Job Centre Plus had interrogated the travel implications for service users. Google Maps appeared to be the only travel expertise applied. Presiding officer, if the council consulted on closing a school in such a manner, the Scottish Government would have the power to call in and to block that decision. It has done in the past. That is precisely what the UK Government must now do. Intervene in a flawed process and save Mary Hill Job Centre as well as others threatened right across the city. Yes, of course. 
Anna Sarwar. Well, Douglas, for taking the intervention and congratulating and bringing forward this really important debate. Just on that point, every single Glasgow MSP and MP is united in their condemnation of the decision to close these job centres. Isn't it time that the UK government listened to the elected members of the city? Bob Doris. Absolutely. And I hope the UK government will also be listening carefully to this debate and use it to inform the decision to halt every single closure right across the city. Mr Sarwar. I need to make a little bit of progress just now, Mr Tompkins. Uh, the Smith Commission agreement referred to job centres, actually, presiding officer, and it called for the UK and Scottish Government to identify ways to further link services through methods such as co-location, wherever possible, and to establish more formal mechanisms to govern the Job Centre Plus network in Scotland. Yet the Department of Work and Pensions don't appear to even have informed in advance the Scottish Government about the proposals that are now before us. Maybe we'll hear more about that later from the Minister. I want to say a little bit more about the Job Centre of Mary Hill, Presiding Officer. It sits directly opposite another office block that is largely unoccupied. The rent on that property would be, in all likelihood, cheap as chips. The DWP could also cast an eye around the corner, just over the canal towards Rock Hill, where there's a former social work building at the Quadrangle, sitting mostly empty, along with other properties at low market rent. The Citizens Advice Bureau is based just down the road at Avenue Park Street. Skills Development Scotland have skills shops at Byers Road and at Saracen Street in Postle Park. Yet there have been no discussions with anyone, with any partner, around any form of partnership working or co-location. The DWP could recognise the current, in a moment, the DWP could recognise the current Mary Hill Job Centre location as a stone's throw away from a new £12 million health and social care centre at Gerbrade Avenue in Maryhill and directly opposite the Maryhill Borough Halls. The area is a growing community hub and I would urge Job Centre Plus not to turn its back on Maryhill and on those I represent who have multiple, bar multiple barriers to employment. If I've got some time added on, presiding officer, I'm happy to take the intervention. Mr Tompkins. Adam Tompkins. Very good for the member to give way. I know time is tight. I appreciate it. Um, I wonder if the member would reflect on the fact that the all-party um, House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee in November of this year reported on the future of job centres. Uh, and the all-party committee unanimously said that the future of Job Centre Plus is one of change and that uh, the Job Centre Plus must be open to working in ways that are increasingly flexible, adaptable and experimental. As I said, that's a unanimous report in, in, signed, up in, signed up by every member of the committee, including the SNP's own Mary Black. What is the evidence that supports the view that just because Glasgow has 16 job centres now, it must always have 16 job centres, even though the nature of job centres and the nature of the employment market is changing? Bob Doris. Mr Tompkins, I'm deeply worried about, about that contribution, that intervention. Actually, I thought we'd cross-party solidarity in relation to this. Mr Tompkins, maybe it's 20 job centres we need. As I go on and look at this, I think you'll see that the UK government was talking about a 20% reduction in job centres. Why has Glasgow been targeted for a 50% cull of our job centres? Why, Mr Tompkins? I have absolutely no idea. I would like to say that I think... Um, the Minister this afternoon, Jamie Hepburn, as well as Damien Hines MP, the Minister of State for the Department of Work and Pensions, should come along to Mary Hill together, together jointly, partnership working, and meet with those directly impacted by the job centre closure, should it go ahead. Mr Hines would see the area for himself, meet with local partners, and better understand the opportunities that exist locally for co-location and for partnership working. Let's improve the support we provide to vulnerable groups, not diminish it. To realise that opportunity, of course, the DWP must first ditch plans to axe Mary Hill Job Centre. I hope Mr Tompkins and his Conservative colleagues will support that call here today in their contributions, not just Mary Hill Job Centre, but right across the city. Glasgow's elected representatives across all parties can see the clear deficiencies in a rushed and threadbare consultation. The risk of sanctions the risk of additional expense, the impact on families, the loss of valued work coaches at a local level are all worrying my constituents. To together with cross-party -party unity, we can halt these closures. I hope this afternoon we can hold that solidarity and meet the needs of those vulnerable people we're all supposed to represent in this chamber. We now move to open speeches. Um, speeches of around four minutes, please. Uh, Annie Wells to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. 
I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak today on an issue that has grown media attention and to thank Bob Doris for bringing this matter to the Chamber. I will not condone the DWP proposals, but neither will I cond condemn them. Glasgow has some of the worst employment rates in the whole of Scotland, and the claimant count in the city is 3.1 per cent compared to 2.2 per cent for Scotland and 1.8 per cent for the UK. And of course, it's important that we support those people into work the best way possible. And I do share the concerns of members here today. I too, as my colleagues are, am concerned about the communication around the proposed closures. Change, whether permissible or not, should not be sprung, among, sprung upon people out of the blue. Consulta consultation on change should not come across as a lip service exercise. And I was disappointed to see the length of time in which it was open. As, an ar as new arguments for and against come to light, people should be given the opportunity to digest the information available and make informed responses. I too, will, I too with the further rollout of universal credit in Scotland, I'm concerned about the increased need to make job centres as accessible as they can. Yes? Bob Doris. Look, Ms Wells, that people have to make informed opinions about this, but given the fact that MSPs in this chamber, MPs, no one else knows how many people use Maryhill Job Centre or even the area that it serves, is that not a fundamentally flawed consultation? And will you agree today, irrespective of your final views on job centres, that every single job centre proposal in Glasgow should be, should be scrapped right now and the DWP should start again? Annie Wells. I agree that we need to monitor the use of job centres, but we also know that the claimant count um, we also know that the claimant count in Glasgow has dropped by forty four percent since two thousand ten, going from twenty four thousand two hundred down to around thirteen and a half thousand. Um, so we, yeah, we do need to we do need to monitor it more closely the usage. I am um, too concerned about the consultation's restriction to just the three job centres. Uh, Mary Hill, Bridgeton and Castle Milk. It's a, it is a difficult situation, however. The 20-year lease contract is coming to an end next year, and it's only logical that we have the discussion now, and we need to at least be open to this. And I'll make a few points for the members to reflect on today. Between 20 to 40 per cent of the floor space in the buildings are currently un underoccupied. And is it right for the government to sit on empty floor space and go rolling into a new contract without at least asking the question as to whether this is a good use of resource? Is it right to send the message that a three-mile journey is plain wrong, no matter the circumstances, when many of the jobs advertised at the centre will require just that and more? And of course, for those with long-term health conditions or disabilities, extra efforts should be made to ensure that the service users are not adversely affected. And I shall make this point well known when I submit my entry to the public consultation. And that's, why it should, and that's what it should be about. It should be about compromise, not black and white decision making. Making the most sensible decision whilst making the necessary provisions for the most vulnerable. And none of the 260 staff relocated as part of this change are expected to lose their jobs. And there has been no mention of the DWP of making cuts to investment. In fact, over 122 additional work coaches were rec recruited to job centre pluses in Scotland last year to ease workload and ensure a service based on rapport. I did not omit to signing Stuart Macdonald's letter because I do not share the, the same concerns. I did not sign it because of the finality of its tone suggests the decision has already been made. And the language used suggested that every person currently visiting job centres will be stricken down by such a change. And I don't think that's a reasonable assertion to make. Particularly, as I've said, if emphasis is put on looking after the most vulnerable with regards to increased journey times. And this is why I encourage all members of the public who feel strongly on this issue to submit their opinions to the DWP through the consultation now details of which I have posted on my website. And I, as much as anyone in the chamber here today, hope the best outcome is reached on this issue. James Dornan, to be followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you very much, President Officer. And before I start, can I just apologise to Bob Doris and yourself that I have to leave after my speech because I've got a, an event to host. 
Uh, I'll come back to the, the comments that Annie Wells just made there, but uh, I'd like to say welcome and thanks for coming to the, the MPs in the audience, Chris, uh, Margaret, Patrick and Anne, and of course my own uh, MP Stuart MacDonald, who's been pushing this very hard in my constituency. When I was first informed that not one but two job centres would be closed in my constituency, obviously my first reaction was one of concern. I represent a diverse community and many of my constituents currently face extreme socio-economic hardship. Job centres are part of a lifeline to many of them. The name job centre would indicate that this is a place to find work, but as every member of this chamber knows, these centres are so much more. They're a place to find employment, yes, but also a place to discuss adult learning, skills acquisition, disability issues, and of course benefits and social securities. Damien Green, the MP, may think that these closures are necessary as the Westminster Government continues to harm the most vulnerable members of Scottish society with their austerity agenda. However, my job is to remind the Tories, both at Westminster and indeed the ones here, of the devastating effects that these closures will have in communities throughout Glasgow. It's been well documented in the media that cruel benefit sanctions are hitting especially hard the desperately ill and those with a disability, who are often unable to reach an appointment due to distance and ill health. Imagine how difficult these appointments will now be for vulnerable people to reach. Mm -hmm. Let me highlight what one of the closures in my constituency will mean for some of the most disadvantaged local residents. Despite what Annie Wells just said there about uh, she doesn't want to see people being stricken down by these changes, the distance between Casamalt Job Centre and Newlands Job Centre, which will remain open, is, according to Google Maps, 15 minutes by car. Now, many of the users of the Castlemilk Job Centres don't have a car. So let's look at that map again. It take, a walk takes 58 minutes for an able-bodied person. Imagine you're a mother with a couple of young kids having to make your way there for fairly regular meetings. And if you don't make those meetings, the sanctions kick in very, very quickly. Imagine you have a mobility issue. And you have to make those meetings, because if you don't make those meetings, the sanctions kick on in very quickly. This is the thoughtlessness that's gone into this whole consultation pro process, this whole pretend that you care process, because this is about blanket, Glasgow, never going to win that place. Who cares? It's poll tax number two. It's just completely unacceptable. I met with a constituent last year who'd had to flee her home because of domestic violence. She's young children, she's living in a bread line, she attends Casamalt Job Centre. And when I was talking to her, she showed me her shoes. And she's got holes in her shoes. And now what you're asking her to do, your government's asking her to do, is walk an extra four miles in those shoes with holes in them to get to that job centre before she gets sanctioned and life becomes even more difficult for ourselves. So let's not pretend that you're trying to make life easier for those on the bread line. You're, you're trying to make life easier for people to get back into work because this measure is quite shameless in the fact that it's taken nobody into account except for the bank balance, except for the bottom line. There's meant to be a consultation here that takes into account people's needs. There's been none of that. This is not a real consultation. We know fine well that at the end of this consultation, there will be no changes of any substance within Glasgow. We will be fighting hard for this. And I know, I was really disappointed, but not surprised, that both Adam Tompkins and Annie Wells never signed that. And I know that they would have been happy to sign it. But I'm not surprised that their party told them, under no circumstances can you sign that. Yes, tell me that you don't agree. Yes, I'm more than happy to give way. Adam Tompkins, please. Absolutely not the case that my party told me to sign or not to sign that letter. I read the letter. I considered every word of that letter. I wanted to be able to sign it, but I advised the author of the letter that, as presently drafted, I was unable to sign it for the reasons that Annie Wells has already given. So if the, if the member would retract that baseless allegation, I'd be grateful. James Dornan. The retracted allegation that I thought that you wanted to keep the job centres open and wanted to sign a letter. My apologies. I just thought that I knew you a bit better than that. You must come it's, to a close, Mr Jordan. I, I will do just now, presiding officer. My apologies. It's very important that despite the concerns that you have for whatever reason, that this is a cross-party thing. We've got cross-party support from all around the chamber, except for this side here. Let's make sure, despite where your concerns are, that we get to a position where you can go back to your masters, we can all push the Westminster government to make sure that these job centres stay open, because if not, you're penalising people who are already suffering and do not deserve to be penalised anymore. Can I take this opportunity to remind members that they should always speak through the chair? 
and I call Johan Lamont to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I shall certainly do my best. Can I congratulate Bob Doris in securing this debate today and recognising the importance of the subject matter? I can't be the only person who was shocked when there was an announcement, I think it was actually um, leaked ahead of the announcement being made, the sense of rush uh, around this question with very little regard to um, the impact on local communities. In fact, it has created significant campaigning activity across the city, and I want particularly to talk about the South Side. And I would also commend the Evening Times and its support for the campaign to address the grave concerns about the implications of these closures. Um, we've heard from Bob Doris about the work that he and his colleagues have, have um, done. But I would also want to highlight the work of my own party, local Labour councillors, Council Archie Graham, Malcolm Cunning and Emma Gillan, and Labour activists like Stephen Livingston, who have, with others, recognised the importance of this issue and have been out highlighting their concerns, their desire to ensure that this is, the, this is stopped, and recognising and talking to the public about the importance of building, building public support to encourage the government to think again um, and to take on um, the, the DWP in this regard. I'm particularly concerned about what's happening in Castlemilk and in Langside, um, but I uh, also recognise there are implications right across the city. And it is, in fact, this morning my Labour colleagues have been out campaigning on this very question and have been struck by the degree of response that they've had across the communities. But it wouldn't be right simply to say what our individual parties have done or indeed recognise, I think, the importance of people beyond party have a very strong views in these matters and campaign groups have highlighted that. But this campaign has been marked by an important effort to make Cross -party, build cross-party consensus at a local level. And I commend those who have done this, whether it's the MP or indeed Frank McAvee, the leader of the council. And I think we have all recognised the importance of, of drawing together on this question. And I would commend this type of working, not just in this particular issue, but regardless of who is making that decision, whether it's the UK government, whether it's the Scottish government, or at local government level. There needs to be a freedom for politicians to have the confidence to come together when these matters are of such significance within our communities. And I do think we should be urging David Mundell to listen to this concerns. Now, you know, Adam Tompkins talked about um, the question of, of evidence, the importance of evidence. The fact is, this was done without evidence. It's not an evidence-based decision, and James Dornan has highlighted this already. I'm concerned that this decision has not been done with any equality impact assessment, because if there had been, you would not target your cuts disproportionately on a city that relies on these services. No understanding of the transport challenge. It's all right to look at Google Maps, but try travelling the bus routes or the walking routes to access these services. If you were living in the real world, and indeed this morning the Petitions Committee was looking at the failures of the bus system and the idea that you would be relying on a bus to travel even further to get access to support without anybody doing the basic work of working out where those transport links are is a nonsense. The reality is it has been a paper exercise. It has not looked at whether there's an impact disproportionately on vulnerable groups, on women, on lone parents, on disabled people who may want to be access, accessing services. This has not been an exercise driven by a rational assessment of need and purpose. It has started at the end of the process and worked its way back. And surely the rational minds that there are on the Conservative benches must accept that that is not acceptable. Now I also recognise that, of course, this becomes even more challenging an issue because of the highly contentious debate around the key elements of the welfare system, an approach of a Tory government which, in George Osborne's unforgivable terms, sought to divide between the workers and the shirkers. So if we believe that it is, if in the argument is that we need to, in the current welfare system to support people into work, why make it so difficult to access that support? If that is the purpose, and that that's their job, why make it more difficult for those who need that support to get it disproportionately in a city like Glasgow, as I've said, that needs it? But even if you do believe in conditionality and the benefits of a sanctioned system, and I don't, 
Why make it more likely to increase the level of sanctions? Why make it more difficult for people to comply? Why make it an issue where you make a decision which is not connected to experience no, she of has ordinary no time, Mr. people? Tompkins. The reality is this decision was made on paper to meet a budget requirement rather than you to must look come at the to needs. Close, we Sarnett. need to start with people in our communities and then make the decisions that follow that. I urge all across this chamber to make their voices heard because implications for families in my city are immensely serious. Uh, before I call Ms White, uh, due to the number of speakers who remain and uh, due to the overrunning of every speech so far, I am minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. Can I invite Bob Doris, please, to move such a motion? Uh, move, Presiding Officer. So the question is, are members agreed that we extend the debate? Okay. Thank you very much. That's agreed. Uh, can I say that doesn't mean that you should fill all of that time? <laughs> and I call Sandra White to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. I was just going to ask if that actually did give me some more time, but I'll stick to the time limit, as, as you said. Can I commend uh, Bob Doris for securing this debate and also thank the many M MPs, some of who are in the gallery today, who raised this very issue at Westminster. Two debates, I believe, were held at Westminster and the Glasgow Evening Times uh, for running an excellent campaign against uh, these job centre closures. As convener of the Social Security Committee, uh, President Officer, we held an evidence session on the 15th of de December, taking evidence from Neil Cooling and Denise Horsfall. And during this session, the job centre closures, which had just been announced, uh, came up. And I would like to read some extracts uh, from that meeting. And I think it will give us a flavour into, as Joanne Lamott has said, this is nothing absolutely to do with people. It was a budgetary exercise to save money. Now, we visited the job centre in Musselburgh previous to this meeting, and uh, I raised this uh, as a convener in the first question. And I mentioned the fact that even though we visited the job centre two weeks ago, we were not aware of any job centre closures. Uh, they couldn't have just been decided a couple of weeks ago uh, or last week. It had to be on the agenda for a number of months. And uh, I said we were given no indication whatsoever of the closures where we were visiting these centres. Now, I did ask specifically about Glasgow, and Denise Horsfall uh, basically came back in following on from the fact that I pointed out that an awful lot of work must have been on in the background previously to come to this decision, and why were we not made aware of it as a committee who's looking at the social, uh, you know, social services, etc., and the new bill coming forward and that. Uh, Denise Horsfall said, I will happily come in about Glasgow specifically to answer the convener. I will say yes, we did not talk about the closures. When we met, I referred to the fact that we were looking at the estate, but I certainly was not specific. It was not in my gift, Denise Horsfall said, it was not in my gift to be specific at that stage. I had no authority to talk to you about it. My authority came on the day of release. Now, obviously, when I mentioned the fact that we weren't told about uh, when it was going to happen, and she has said, and it's in the official report, she also went on to say that, um, yes, they had looked at various issues, such as uh, Google, Google Maps, and Travel Line, and that's in commas, it's by her own admission. And she also said, by her own admission, I get that it's not the same as getting on or off a bus, and certainly true of people who aren't getting on or off a bus. I then mentioned the fact that, um, when did this happen? Why weren't we uh, told about that? Uh, Denise Horsfall reply came in and said, without a doubt, convener, you're absolutely right, convener. They did not just drop out of fresh air. There was a discussion about what seemed to be acceptable and available for the city of Glasgow, what the best use of the estate was, and how we were going to deliver the services. These proposals then went to a consultation period with the landlords, not with the people, not with the parliament, not with elected members, but most importantly of all, not with the people that are going to be using these services with the landlords. Now, that, you know, you have only one decision to make after that, is that this is nothing at all to do with the people, getting people into work helping people. How can you say that people who are disabled, who, folk who are on the very breadline, might need to take two or three buses, might need to walk, as already been mentioned. 
They didn't bother about them. All they were caring about was how much it was going to cost the estate. And I know that Adam Tompkins did raise this matter in the committee. I don't know if Mr Tompkins is going to speak or not. He may elaborate on that fact. But I know this was raised in the committee about couldn't a deal have been done? Uh, Castle Milk Job Centre, for instance, the landlord there said that he would drop his rates, but they didn't bother saying anything about that. And this was raised at the committee. So from the evidence we were given at the committee, you can only come to one conclusion. The people were not considered at all. They didn't matter. So people, as has been mentioned before, vulnerable, disabled, single families, young kids, doesn't matter about them. All that matters is money. And we must ensure that these job centres are safe. Thank you very much, President Officer. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you. Can I very sincerely thank Bob Doris for bringing this important debate to the Chamber uh, for discussion today and pay tribute as well to the broad support uh, for this concern. I think it's refreshing, actually, and significant that this is an issue which brings together the Scottish Government's supporters and its critics. It's not an issue that divides down constitutional lines. This is something which has united political uh, activists from a number of parties, politicians from local, national and UK level, as well as a wide range of organisations and other services working in people's communities. I think people are responding with astonishment. Uh, and uh, uh, anger to this proposal. Uh, and I'm very pleased as well, as Sandra White said, that the Evening Times have been drawing public attention uh, to this issue through their work as well. The starting point for me on an issue like this is a desire for a fundamentally different kind of welfare system, a different kind of social security system. For decades now, not just recent years with the, the Tory government, but I believe for decades, the social security system has turned into one, from one which is supposed to be about providing security for people into one which is designed to bully people into low paid work. The kind of social security system which I would want to see, yes, would make some services available online or over the phone, that's obviously got benefits. But the most important thing that it has to do is have people working with people to support them to overcome the very serious barriers that they have to re-enter work or to find appropriate work or to make that work work for them and for their own life circumstances. And that means services in local communities. People working with people. People who know the local community, its transport links, the kind of work that's available and the kind of issues that people face in that community. It's absolutely vital to have those local services protected. Even if the level of demand reduces, and we should want it to reduce, the local nature of those services is absolutely critical to ensuring that the service is effective. The letter that we've all seen from Damien Hines setting out the closures that were proposed ends with the phrase, three of the proposed site closures May lead, may lead to longer journey times for some claimants. It's absolutely inevitable that it will lead to unacceptable journey times and costs. Even for those uh, who, are, uh, who qualify for a job centre travel discount card and who manage to uh, get access to that, even there, uh, the, the, the reduced rate of a single trip uh, across city zones, which many of the people impacted by these cuts will be crossing the, the, the first bus zones in Glasgow. Even the reduced rate is £2 for a single journey. So a great many of those people will still find themselves having to buy an all-day ticket, which is £4.50. £4.50. And it's not good enough to say, uh, as Annie Wells did, that if people can get a job, uh, that it might involve just as much travel. So why, you know, people should... Uh, be willing to travel work, they should be willing to travel for a job centre. A job pays a wage. A job pays a wage. Going to the job centre doesn't. It's absolutely uh, outrageous to imagine that people can bear these costs. Like others, uh, I, I've uh, happily, as members know, want to encourage people to walk and cycle around our city as well. But even I would think twice at the hill up to Castle Milk on my bike. The like James Dornan, uh, walking would, would be an option. He talked about that. Myself, 
some of my uh, Green Party colleagues and activists and candidates organised a walk from the Bridgeton Job Centre to Shettleston. And again, nearly an hour that walk took, nearly an hour. And that, again, doesn't even consider the barriers that people with reduced mobility, with disability, or with other commitments for their time in terms of family care, people wouldn't be able to make that commitment. Two things are inevitable consequences of these changes. More people will miss appointments. More people will be sanctioned as a result and not get the support and services that they need. And secondly, more people will be forced deeper into poverty by having to bear the additional travel cost burden. I think the Scottish Conservatives are due some credit for turning up today. I pay tribute to them for that. But they should come here with an opinion. They have an absolutely privileged position in this debate because if they add their support to the existing cross-party support for concern on this issue, I think we've got the ability to tell the UK government to change its position. They're the ones who need to add their support to have complete cross-party consensus on this issue, and I urge them to do so as soon as possible. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to take this opportunity to also congratulate Mr Doris on securing this important debate today. The proposed closure of the job centres in Glasgow, whilst in itself a reserve matter, is one that this place should be debating. And I'm glad we have the opportunity to debate what is an important issue for his constituents today. My position mirrors that of my colleague Annie Wells. Given the nuances, I won't condemn the proposals, but neither will I condone them and the process currently followed. Across the United Kingdom, the Department for Work and Pensions has committed to reducing the size of its estate by 20%, a decision taken due to changing circumstances and facts as they are on the ground today. This comes as we near the end of a costly 20-year PFI contract signed by the Labour government for the upkeep of many DWP offices. Recent figures show that across the UK, the reduction <coughs> in numbers of claimants and the system changes have resulted in the DWP using only 25% of the space that they pay for under the PFI contract. And we must also note that the claimant count across the UK has dropped from 1.5 million in 2010 to around 800,000 today. In Glasgow itself, in that same time frame, the claimant count has almost halved. In Glasgow East, it has dropped by 47% in less than seven years. But that still means that over 13,000 people are needing the vital services that job centres provide. And the concern demonstrated across this whole chamber about what the proposed closures could mean for those people and the process that has been gone through is one that must be recognised by the DWP as they continue their consultation. So, a review is being undertaken. The proposals seek to bring smaller, less busy job centres together into larger existing sites, thereby reducing the DWP's rents and freeing up services with a view to delivering a higher quality of service for benefit claimants. And the UK has made this pledge, and it is one I wholeheartedly endorse, that no w DWP staff will be made redundant because of these changes. If anything, the DWP workforce looks set to grow in Scotland with 122 new work coaches recruited just last year. As Annie Wells has said, and will make clear in her submission to the DWP through the consultation, however, for those with long-term health conditions or disabilities, much more effort is needed to ensure that service users are not adversely affected by any of the proposed changes. Deputy Presiding Officer, we must not lose sight of the uncertainty and trauma caused by being made unemployed. I do not doubt the worry for people when they read that their local job centre is to be closed. And it is down to us, their elected representatives, to assure them that they are not being abandoned, to make sure that the changes, if they happen, are acceptable and result in better service delivery for those that need them. And I urge all here today and all those watching at home who have concerns over the proposals to submit, to, to submit them to the consultation. For it is only by working together, cross-party, in the interests of constituents that we will find a solution that works for everyone and that we can truly create a job centre service fit for the 21st century, one that will deliver real results for the people of Scotland.
Thank you. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Claire Hockey. I'd like to begin by thanking Bob Doris for having this important debate and for Stuart Macdonald who coordinated the letter so far of MSPs across the parties that would seem except for the Tory party representing Glasgow and I would be interested to know in what terms you would have signed a letter of solidarity with the rest of the MSPs representing the city. I also please that the Evening Times is back in a campaign because for me from what I have read so far the complete lack of analysis on the requirements for Glasgow is an attack on the city of Glasgow and an attack on the city of Glasgow as far as I'm concerned should have all of Glasgow's representatives fighting its corner because one in ten adults in Glasgow has never had a job. In the area of Parkhead and Dormarnock, six out of ten families are lone parent families. Glasgow is home to some of the most deprived communities and we face seven closures, 50 per cent of Glasgow's job centres across the city. It appears that Glasgow has been singled out for unfair treatment. One in four people still have no access to the internet. So if this is part of a wider plan because the DWP, as we know, are already moving to universal credit, a system which is vastly becoming discredited as far as I've been hearing this morning, the city is certainly not ready to make that transition. Unemployment is still 7.7%. Job centres are a lifeline for cities like Glasgow, where people are seeking work. But as I've just said, I would have some respect for the consultation, I suppose, if there was some analysis. But what we've heard is complete contradictions from the ministerial letter, which I will get to. No real analysis about how people will get to the new arrangements. You don't even know the numbers of people using the job centres. So how this consultation was even allowed out the door, I do not know. The one thing I would say where there has been some element of solidarity... Yes, I will. Adam Tompkins. Very, very grateful to the member for giving way. What we do know, as the member will surely um, accept, is that the claimant count in Glasgow has fallen by 44%. In, in the last seven years, from uh, down to 13,500. That's still too high, but it's a significant reduction. It, you know, is it not rational, given a 44% decline in the claimant count, to, to think about the number of job centres that a city like Glasgow continues to need? Pauline McNeill. If that is the Tory position argument in this debate, you do, not, you do not understand the city of Glasgow, and you're not taking into account any of the characteristics about the city which I am describing. Because the city is not ready. The city is not... And, and uh, the, the Tory position, as I've heard in previous debates, about getting people back to work, job centres are a lifeline for people. It's a very poor strategy, at worst, if, 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 it's, if it's based um, on that. Well, we're not even clear as to why. Is it part of a bigger plan? Um, the committee, as you'll know, Adam Tompkins learned that it seems to be part of a wider uh, review on the estates. And I want to just get to the minister's um, letter, because I think it is worth reading it out. The point I was about to make was at least there's one area of solidarity, which is that the, the Social Security Committee worked together to call on the DWP to extend the consultation to the 31st of January, which previously would have closed a week after Christmas. So we do have some time. And I'd also like to use my contribution to encourage people to respond to the consultation by writing to Etta Wright at Lawrison Job Centre in Glasgow. I think it's really important and I actually believe that it is possible to save some of these job centres. So again, that's why I look to the benches opposite. If you really want to save some of these uh, job centres from closure, then you really need to work more closely with the other parties on this. Because the justification that we've been given uh, by the Minister um, is that it will provide an estate that's right for the city. There's nothing about this which is right for the city. The letter talks about, I would like to reassure you that the reduction in sites in Glasgow is in line with an overall plan to reduce the total amount of space that we occupy. The number of job centres marked for closure reflects the preponderance of smaller job centres in Glasgow. I'm sorry, but this is just, it's not a floor space issue. It's about the needs and the requirements of unemployed. As many others have talked about the practicalities, 
We have heard many times the very spurious reasons which sanctions are applied. One of, the, one of the reasons which sanctions can be applied to individual claimants is if you are late for your appointment. And there is much more likelihood of people being late for their appointment under these proposals. I mean, by the DWP's own admission, when they did look at estimated walking times between job centres, in the case of Bridgeton to Shettleston, it is 30 minutes. Must in come to the case of Castle Milk to Newlands, it is 45 minutes. By their own admission, these walking times do exceed the agreement they had in two, 2000 and, uh, 2011 that it would be a maximum of 20 minutes. Join the parties opposite here. Let's fight together and at least save some of Glasgow's job centres for the City of Glasgow. I call Claire Hockey to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would also like to thank uh, Bob Doris uh, for bringing this uh, debate and the members who have signed the motion for affording us the opportunity uh, to debate this issue today. Presiding Officer, job centres play an important role in supporting those seeking work. They are also an important point of contact for local businesses looking to recruit and for local and national initiatives that seek to support people into work, as well as encouraging growth and opportunity for all. And it's widely accepted that having meaningful employment in a fair work environment, paying a living wage, has a positive impact on health and well-being. Yesterday in this chamber, we debated a Conservative motion on health inequalities, and nothing could demonstrate the glaring divergence between the Tory sham concern about health inequality than the UK government's actions in the area of welfare and benefits. The outrageous decision to close half the job centres in Glasgow region, including Cambus Lang Job Centre in my own constituency, is just another example of the disregard shown by the Tories to the vulnerable in our society. As we have heard, this announcement was made without prior consultation. No consultation with elected members or local communities, service users or DWP unions or employees. Indeed, following answers in the House of Commons to questions from Margaret Ferrier MP and Angus Robertson MP, it became clear that the Tory Secretary of State for Scotland was also kept in the dark on what the DWP was up to. Presiding officer, I grew up in my constituency in Rutherglen and have been fortunate enough to work in my constituency also. I have seen Rutherglen and Glasgow suffer from heavy joblessness as, a, uh, as traditional industry collapsed in Scotland in the 1980s. And the transition from that industrial past has been tough on constituencies like mine. Manufacturing jobs, which used to number in thousands only a few decades ago, guaranteeing jobs for people in Rutherglen and Cambus Lang and Blantyre, now number in the hundreds. And this story is, a fam is familiar to many communities across Scotland. Uh, but it's especially relevant in Glasgow, where joblessness and lower in incomes and historic underinvestment in public services have come together to contribute to high unemployment and high underemployment. To cut 20% of job centres in Scotland in the current climate, with the plummeting pound, uncertainties around access to markets and potential tariffs on Scottish goods would be bad enough. But to close half the job centres in Glasgow region smacks of an overreach reminiscent of Margaret Thatcher's poll tax, which has already been referenced in this debate. And this is just another example of the Westminster Tories' uh, disregard for Scotland and especially for the unemployed and underemployed in their communities. If Glasgow's job list can be hammered with nearly 70,000 people affected with no resistance, then the Conservative government would be emboldened to roll out further essential cuts to services. And that's at the heart of it. It's not just about job centres. It's about a sustained campaign of defunding all public services and transferring provision, where profitable, to the private sector. And this is happening while Glasgow has a 7.7% rate of unemployment, 2.3 higher than the UK average. These are not job centres around the corner from each other, but services located in distinct local communities that have very specific catchment areas. For example, in the area of Halfway and Cambus Lang, the walk to the nearest job centre will increase from 30 minutes to over an hour. And that's what the job centre closures completely disregard the local impact in communities and the real people caught up in this. We are in a situation where DWP staff are being advised to not process appeals and sanctions are a real and present threat to ordinary people. Now that hour long walk from halfway suddenly seems more stressful when being five minutes late could have a devastating impact on the benefits you receive. Decreasing access at best will result in more stress for people in a vulnerable position, but at worst will result in hunger and homelessness. 
In fact, with these planned closures, the DWP should be loosening the sanctions regime in order to ensure that people moving to a different job centre are not punished for having difficulty in getting to their appointments in time. In conclusion, presiding officer, we should be maintaining the services we already have, and in areas of higher need, we should in fact be looking at how to develop those services, not cut them back. As my colleague Bob Doris highlights in his motion, we need a social security system with dignity and respect at its heart, not one that imposes these closures on the most vulnerable in our society. The last of the open speakers is Adam Tompkins. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like very warmly and genuinely to thank Bob Doris for bringing this important debate to the Chamber uh, this afternoon. And uh, indeed, I think it's perfectly appropriate that we've spent, or will have spent, a, a full hour uh, discussing it. I'd also like to thank, uh, if I may, the Minister, Jamie Hepburn, for the open and transparent way uh, in which he has commendably uh, kept Glasgow representatives from across the political spectrum informed um, of uh, his communications with the DWP and the contrast, I'm afraid to say, between the openness of the Scottish Government and the lack of transparency on the DWP's part is quite marked uh, in this instance. Um, on the day that Annie Wells and I discovered that these uh, uh, proposals were um, uh, on the table, um, uh, we wrote to the Secretary of State uh, and we uh, received a response the following day uh, on the 8th of December. That correspondence is in the public domain because it's been released under uh, FOI. And we expressed a number of concerns, uh, some of which I still have, some of which have not been resolved, about the process and about the substance uh, of this uh, consultation. But I think it is important, presiding officer, to understand the context in which this is happening. And there are two elements to this. The first is that there is, at Westminster, an all-party agreement, including the SNP, uh, that the future of Job Centre Plus needs to be different from the past of Job Centre Plus. The nature of the employment market is changing. The nature of the work that is undertaken by job centres is changing. For example, it's increasingly important in the work of job centres that job centres have the facility, have the space, to act as hubs for local employers so that employers can seek to hire uh, employees uh, at those uh, job centres. That's easier to do with a smaller number of larger job, job centres than it is with a larger number of smaller job centres. Um, and I think it is worth recalling what the, as I say, all-party House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee had to say about this in November. The future of Job Centre Plus is one of change. And to make a success of its new expanded role, Job Centre Plus will have to ensure that it is open to working in ways that are increasingly flexible, adaptable and experimental. But all of that said, I'll, I'll give two, two seconds if I may, all of that said, I, I have to say I was very taken, I don't always agree uh, with Patrick Harvey, but I was very taken with the way in which Patrick Harvey expressed the important point that even if the nature of the demand is changing, it remains important. It remains an important consideration that that demand is delivered uh, locally. I, I'm very taken with that point, and I'll certainly relay that back to the Secretary of State. Bob Doris. I, I thank Mr Tompkins for, for, for giving way. Uh, you referred, Mr Tompkins, to the idea of uh, the provision for those seeking employment changing, that, 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 that uh, need for reform. I'm just wondering, one suggestion made actually in the, the Smith Commission uh, is the idea of job centres co-locating for a tailored service along with maybe Skills Development Scotland, Skill Shops and Citizens Advice. Mary Hill would be a prime location for such a co-located service. Would you agree with me that Job Centre Plus and DWP should decide that they should halt the closure of the Mary Hill Centre and they should explore this dynamically with all partners? Adam Tompkins. In favour of exploring options with regard to co-location, and that's indeed one of the issues that the Minister has written to the Secretary of State um, a, a, about. I think that's incredibly important. I want to see more joined working, more joined up government between the UK Government and the Scottish Government about the delivery of employability services and about the delivery, the delivery of our social security system. I think that's one of the directions in which the Smith Commission moved, and I was very uh, pleased uh, to see that. Um, I think it is also important, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, to understand what's not happening here. Specifically, uh, what's not happening here is a number of things that, the, that Claire Hockey just accused uh, uh, wrongly, I think, of, of happening. This is about trying to enhance services, not cut them. It's about trying to improve claimant access to more employers. Um, there are, these, are, these are proposals for a reduction in floor space only. That isn't to diminish their importance, it's just to try and understand exactly what is and is not happening here. All staff and services will be re relocated. There are no planned job losses. And indeed, as Liam Kerr, I think, said in his remarks, the number of work coaches in Scotland is going up 
122 work coaches were hired by DWP in Scotland between April and September uh, last year, notwithstanding the fact uh, that there are fewer claimants uh, than there have been since the 1970s. Ongoing concerns that I have, Deputy Presiding Officer, I am concerned that the consultation uh, that we have for Bridgeton, Castle Milk and Mary Hill is not also being extended to the other five job centres. I am concerned about that. I have raised that concern with the Secretary of State and I will happily uh, do so. Well, not exactly happily, but I will certainly do so uh, again. Um, I was very concerned, uh, as were Pauline McNeill and Sandra White, who are other members of, or Sandra White, of course, the convener of the Social Security Committee, at the uh, very truncated timescale for the consultation for Bridgeton Castle Milk in Mary Hill. And I was very pleased that the Social Security Committee was able, through its cross-party pressure, on officials to have that period of consultation extended. My final point is this. I visited Partick Job Centre on Monday. And Partick Job Centre is one of the larger job centres uh, in Glasgow. It's in Sandra White's uh, constituency. And I asked staff and managers uh, at Partick about the DWP's plans. And one of the things that's happening uh, in that part of Glasgow is that Annie's Land Job Centre uh, is to close and the work of Annie's Land Job Centre is to be rolled into the work of Partick. Both frontline staff and managers, managers, managers at Partick assured me that there was ample capacity in Partick to absorb the additional work from Annie's Land. And they also told me that Annie's Land Job Centre is working at only one third capacity. And I asked them how they knew this because I knew that the uh, issue of how we measure job centre capacity uh, has been challenged in the House of Commons. And they said, well, it's a three storey building and two storeys of it are closed. So only one third of the building that the, that the taxpayer is renting. Uh, it is being used. In fact, the other two-thirds of it are being leased out to other government departments. So this, I think, indicates the magnitude of what we're talking about here. We are talking about redesigning more effective job centres for a city such as Glasgow rather than cutting services. And if we held that in our minds, perhaps uh, we'd understand the proposals a little bit more clearly. Thank you very much. I now call on Jamie Hepburn to close this debate. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. And can I uh, begin by joining with others to, for, to thank uh, Bob Doris for bringing this debate to the Chamber uh, this afternoon? Can I thank uh, those members who have contributed to the debate as well, and indeed those who have uh, stayed behind to uh, watch the debate? Can I thank in particular uh, the Conservative members who have stayed behind? I couldn't help but notice that they were out in force today, uh, President Officer. I counted over 20. Conservative representatives at the start. I know there's rather fewer now. Some of them have sloped off, but there were two, over 20 Conservative MSPs at the beginning of today's debate, which is rather unusual, it has to be said, for a member's business debate. I can't think why uh, they stayed in such numbers. I would uh, very much concur with the point that uh, Patrick Harvey made that uh, uh, it would be good to have heard rather more opinion coming from, although we heard a, a bit more from Mr Tompkins, to be fair, rather more opinion coming from those uh, pensions. But in the uh, absence of such, I think it is at least incumbent on the massed ranks of Conservatives who stayed here today to have at least brought their ears with them, if not an opinion, to have listened to what was said and to take back a very clear message to those representatives of their party in government at Westminster and to express the opinions that they have heard here in this uh, Scottish Parliament. Can I also uh, welcome those uh, Glasgow MPs who have come to the uh, gallery today. I know they've been undertaking a range of activity uh, in uh, Westminster to uh, bring this uh, issue to the fore, and as have uh, those or most of those uh, representatives of the City of Glasgow elected uh, to this uh, place. We've heard very much uh, concern expressed uh, over the course of this debate about the impact on uh, communities, the impact on uh, the individual, and uh, we quite often in uh, parliamentary discourse use the term individual, President Officer, but of course what we actually mean by uh, an individual is a person. We're talking about people. Uh, we're talking about our neighbours, our friends, our family, those who live and work around us, all of us, any of us, any one of us uh, may need uh, support from the social security system from time to time. And I very much share uh, the concerns that the, these particular closures will make access and support much harder in the city of Glasgow City. I was very proud to have been born and raised in, of course. Pauline McNeill.
Uh, excuse me, Miss McNeil, could you check your card? Your mic's not on. That would help. <laughs> Given the last point that Mr Tompkins made about the estate, and so the, the example of Annie's land, where they're, they're occupying only one block, if that is an issue, is the Scottish Government in a position to talk to the DWP about uh, perhaps uh, any, you know, any other buildings that could be used? Jamie Hepburn. I'm planning to come to that a little later, but let me come to that very issue uh, right now, because what we seem to clearly see uh, behind this particular decision to close the particular job centres in Glasgow, it seems to be driven by the fact that contracts or leases, lease arrangements for particular buildings are coming to an end. I should observe in the first instance, I think that's a peculiar way in which to determine where a particular job centre might be located. I think it would be rather better to see what community need uh, is required. And secondly, I think uh, the, the point that Polly McNeill correctly makes about under occupancy of particular buildings is also a secondary consideration in terms of where a particular job centre is closed. I think the point we're making here, and I, again I hope this is heard very clearly, isn't about the particular buildings that a particular job centre might be located in, it's about the particular communities that they are located in. And I think a number of members have made the very sensible uh, point, the very opposite point that there is uh, great benefits by which we could seek to see co-location of services. We have a range of offices through Skills Development Scotland. I know that Glasgow City Council have a range of offices through, through uh, social work, for example, where there could be a uh, co-location. So an answer and summary uh, uh, in terms of responding to the point that Polly McNeill uh, makes, yes, this government will be always very uh, pleased, or maybe not pleased in this instance, given the subject matter, but very willing to engage in dialogue with the UK government, with the Department of Work and Pensions about such matters. And indeed, I had a meeting with uh, Damien Hines, the Minister for Employment, earlier today. A fairly constructive meeting, I should say, although words are always easy, of course, for a hearing officer. And I'm very clear that we need to uh, continue dialogue in that regard. And I'm also very clear, uh, President Officer, that we need to continue dialogue around the clear commitment that was made in the Smith Commission process about a greater role for the Scottish Government in management of the Job Centre Plus, set out, as Mr Tompkins will know, because he was on the Smith Commission, paragraph 58, eh, with a greater emphasis and responsibility for the Scottish Government, jointly with the UK Government for the Job Centre Plus. And I, I make that point not just to make a, a constitutional flag in the sand eh, type argument, I make it for a very practical eh, reason, presiding officer, because if we had such a process in place, presumably it wouldn't have meant the Scottish Government in common with uh, everyone else finding out about these closures through uh, the pages of the Daily Record. We might have had some prior warning during which we could have raised our concerns, we could have made the offer to co-locate and we could have perhaps influenced a change in mindset. We could have also raised the very real concerns I have about the potential negative impact on the coming uh, devolution of the employment programme where we're going to rely uh, heavily on Job Centre Plus to be a conduit for reference or referrals into that programme. Again, we could see a negative impact in that, that regard. But today, uh, we debate the uh, significant negative impact on people on the ground. We have heard very clearly that uh, those individuals, those people, I should say, going back to the terminology I uh, think more correctly used, earlier President Officer will be faced with increased travel costs and increased travelling time to engage with what might be their newly designated uh, job centre, which uh, in the case of Mary Hill, an area of Glasgow that Mr Doris knows that I know very well and his uh, constituency will all be almost four miles away in Springburn in, in that particular case, because he's quite correct to raise the concerns of the increased pressure on Springburn. A job centre. We already know that Springburn has the highest volume of customers claiming uh, GSA and universal credit in the city. So there's going to be a clear uh, negative uh, impact. I'm also, and this government is also very concerned, I mean, we've clearly expressed over a long period of time, President Officer, our uh, concern about the policy uh, of uh, the UK government's particular form of conditionality and its sanctions regime. I'm very concerned that this uh, these changes will lead to an increased number of sanctions in the city of Glasgow. I wrote to uh, Damien Green, the Secretary of State uh, for Work and Pensions, on this uh, particular 
uh, matter. He wrote back to me saying there'll be no change in policy for those individuals affected. But that misses the point. That fundamentally misses the point. It's not about the change in policy for those individuals. It's about the change in circumstances just by its very nature for people having to travel uh, much further to access services. There is, of course, going to be uh, a delay in them arriving. There's, of course, going to be uh, people arriving late for appointments and missed appointments. And we know that in many cases that can lead uh, to them being sanctioned. Uh, President, so there is, is much more I could say about this, but let me be very clear if it's not clear uh, already. The Scottish Government's clear uh, preference would be for us to have been rather better engaged uh, in this uh, process. So we could have raised our concerns. Uh, we're also concerned that this is only the first raft of closures uh, set for Scotland. We're not clear uh, where others might be. We're not clear when they may be announced. So it's very likely we'll be coming back to debate this subject matter again. But uh, I'd like to reassure all uh, members, not only am I asking Conservative members to take the message back to the UK Government, uh, next month the Cabinet Secretary for Community, Social Security and Equalities, the Minister for Social Security and myself will meet Damien Green at next month's Joint Ministerial group, Working Group on Welfare and I can assure members that this will be a matter which we discuss. This meeting is suspended until 2.30pm. <laughs>